Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Peter Whittle. Now I'm delighted that my guest this week is someone, well, I don't know whether I could call him a friend of the channel, but he's been on a lot of times. I'm um, very pleased to say David Starkey, uh, Britain's best known historian. Uh, thank you for joining us again, David. Um, we have just had a week here uh, in Westminster of a conference called National Conservatism. You spoke at it. Um, you were talking about history and heritage. What, what was the gist of what you were saying? What was I saying? I was trying to say that, um, to begin at the beginning, the conference is organised by an American organisation yeah. called the Edmund Burke Society. Yes. Uh, it is characterised crudely by the British press as right, or indeed, it's now almost impossible to be right when you are far right, yeah, yeah. Uh, because right has become a term of execration. Uh, Edmund Burke is, of course, generally speaking, regarded as the founder of conservative political thought in reaction to the French Revolution. Uh, what he does, he argues uh, in the in the. Uh, the the handful of wonderful passages. The, um, he writes an immediate response to the French Revolution within a year uh, of its breaking out uh, called Reflections on the Revolution in France. Most of it, you know, dare I say it, it's a great classic, is absolutely tedious. It's an, <laughs> it's, an, it's an account of the f crisis of the French currency mm. produced by a paper currency <laughs> called Assigna. And you can forget it, you can, you can skip page after page after page. There are about ten passages of some of the finest prose in the language, the sharpest thought the most moving ideas and uh, what Burke does he takes the essential message of the French Revolution to be that of rationalism in politics mm. now reason is a word that we tend to rate very highly he points out that a reason that is unanchored in experience that is unanchored in humanity that is unanchored in place is a profoundly dangerous and destructive thing mm. uh, he opposes to that notion of an abstract reason. You remember the culmination of the terror is um, uh, uh, the goddess reason impersonated by a rather louche actress from the Comédie Française reclining virtually naked on the desecrated altar of Notre Dame. That's the culmination, <laughs> yeah. that's the culmination of reason, uh, you know, with a tide of blood flowing, flowing beneath. And he, he juxtaposes, contrasts to that notion of reason, if you like, ancestral wisdom. He points out that the British constitution, unlike the newfangled constitution in France, isn't a creation of a moment. It's not the creation of individual act of will. It's not an attempt at applying abstract principles. It is a growth of time. It is a product of history and of the historical experience of a particular people. And moreover, he argues, it is therefore durable and will endure, whereas the creation of the French Revolution will be a mere, a mere yes. jumped up weed yes. that will grow quickly and die quickly. Mm -hmm. And of course, like all the prophecies, this, the, one of the astonishing features of the reflections uh, on the revolution in France, it takes place before the terror, it takes place uh, before Napoleon, it takes place before mob rule, the guillotine, whatever. He predicts the lot. Mm. And similarly, he predicts the instability. Mm. Because of course, the result of the revolution in France, I didn't tell you, is five republics, mm. two empires and two monarchies in the space of barely 200 years. Yeah. The most instable of West, unstable of Western political systems. Whereas ours, continues rather ramshackle and a bit battered mm. and you know, a bit undermined by new labor to sort of lumber on pretty much as was yeah. from about 1265 or whenever the new model parliament was <laughs> uh, 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 the model parliament was um, uh, uh, and what I was what I'm what I was trying to argue was that the um, that we need to understand that if we're to talk about national conservatism Obviously, the idea of the nation state yes. is at the center yeah. of that. What you then have to do, you have to believe that the nation state and its history and its story, which, as Burke says, is that contract 
between past, present and future. It's not that contract within a generation, it's a contract across generations. You have to believe it has moral worth. Mm. You have to believe it has value. And what I tried to do was to show that the challenge to the authority of the nation state isn't something new, it's not, not just the French Revolution, it's not, it's not communism or whatever, it goes right, right back to earlier forms of universalist doctrine. And because we have behind us, I'm delighted to say, an acknowledgement of the period of history, um, which, which I suppose has made me and I've partly made it, uh, namely the Tudors, and um, that, that dispute between an, an idea of nationhood and the and, and, and nat the national state uh, and the universal mm -hmm. is of course at the heart of the Tudor period. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at the heart of the Tudor period uh, for the very good reason that you get on the one hand Thomas More in Utopia arguing for universal Christian values. Uh, particularly values that repudiate notions of aristocracy, of violence, of war, of crude displays of wealth um, uh, in his utopia, which is yeah. nowhere. And the whole point about n utopia is to contrast it with just what an awful dump England was. Yes. And, and what that <laughs> gives rise to is a completely different set of arguments, which I summarize very quickly by the way I didn't have I, I was doing this in 10 minutes so I yes, did, not, right. did not have the luxury of the <laughs> of the exposition which you were allowing yeah. me so anybody who was completely puzzled by what they heard me say <laughs> on Wednesday is now getting a thorough refresher course and um, uh, and what I what I tried to say was that 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 in the Tudor period you get this response targeting more arguing that Moore's uh, elevation of an imaginary commonwealth is wrong and that the actual English commonwealth, the English state, is a good state, not a perfect state. You see, again, it's an argument between good and perfection. Yes. What, the, what all revolutionaries aim to do is to create perfection. Yeah. The only way you can per uh, create perfection is by doing terrible things to human beings because we human beings aren't perfect. So you've got to make them perfect. And of course, because you know you're right, you think you can make them right by force, by terror, by forced labor camps, by electrocution, by all the horrors that dictatorships on the right and left have deployed. The English don't think that. They think they have a good state and they think they have one that's capable of self-improvement. In other words, it's got a political process which can, can accommodate ideas of debate and reason and get better. And they model themselves, particularly uh, because, of course, English law is already very ancient. It's unique in European legal systems in having a completely separate independence from the state and from earlier ideas of Roman law, because in London, you can still see that there's so much. You know, our history is under our feet in this city. Yes. What's so remarkable about it. Um, in the Inns of Court, the Inns of Court are founded in the late Middle Ages as a special school of law for the teaching of English common law. So it has an immense intellectual standing and authority. So we again think of things like the rule of law as modern inventions. They're not. They are rooted in the English yeah. experience, as is security of property right, <coughs> is, as by and large is habeas corpus and all the rest of it. And the English are aware of this. And so what they do, they compare themselves, because this is the moment of the Renaissance, they compare themselves to uh, the Roman state, to the Roman Republican state. And they see themselves as exemplifying exactly the same kind of structures aristocratic with a with a mixed rep, with a, with a, with a, with a mixed representative assembly the house of lords being the equivalent of the roman senate the the, the assembly of the plebs being the the equivalent of, of, the, of the house of house uh, house of commons but with the advantage they see it of having a single head rather than the alternating consuls and whatever but they see it as a legitimate republic and what's very striking again they actually write off their own country, although it's a monarchy, they write of it as a republic. Right. In other words, <coughs> the republic doesn't mean non-royal. It means a state 
with known laws that bind the ruler. Right. And this again is a, is a profound misunderstanding that we have about England. It, when one of the great leaders of the American Revolution, John Adams, one of the most intelligent intellectual of them, as early as the 1760s, that's long before the movement for independence gets underway, writes of England, the English monarchy, as a republic. He says the fact that the chief magistrate is hereditary doesn't make any difference. It's the fact that he operates under laws and in known institutions. You know, it's not an absolute monarchy, and I would argue never has been, yeah. as indeed uh, you know uh, the coronation illustrated what the what the king did in the coronation, although it was masked by lots of guff language. What the king does in the coronation, he first of all swears an oath to the laws. Um, and it, indeed, if, if, the, if the coronation oath had been given in its proper form, which was established in 1689, the king swears to rule according to the laws made by statute in Parliament. Uh, absolutely yes, yes, clear yes, cut. Yes. He, you know, he's as much under. In other words, this notion that rights depend on, as it were, a, 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 a political rights depend on a are modern and b depend on progressivism c depend on a republican movement d b depend on protests and whatever is completely rubbish that that that, that they are they are they're totally entrenched into our politics and political history so what i'm trying to do is is to say if you were to have a theory of national conservatism what you begin by doing is re is is recognizing the quite peculiar quality of the Anglo-American system because broadly this was exported directly across the Atlantic yep. with mm -hmm. the American Revolution. There's all the nonsense in the Declaration of Independence about we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are born free and equal. First they're not true, secondly yeah. they're not self-evident and third they manifest rubbish. You're not born free, you're born sh pissing and shitting you know and, yes. and you, you require looking after um, for years and years and years um, but, but, but the, 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 the key thing to understand is that Political rights are not grounded in the abstract and abstract reason. They're grounded in local experience. So that's the point about national conservatism and the Anglo-American experience. The bigger one is, of course, that not all nations are born free and equal. Mm. If you're a Russian, if you're French, uh, if you're Italian, I'm sorry, you have a terrible national experience. Yeah, the, yeah. The, you know, if we, everybody is very surprised about how the Russians and Russian soldiers have behaved. The mutilation, the savagery, mm. at the same time their sheep-like willingness to walk and be killed. Well, what do you expect if you've been ruled by an absolute monarchy forever and ever, which is then succeeded by a communism which is even more absolute, even nastier, yep. and continues yep. to you know, employ exactly the same instruments? Are you surprised the French behave as they do when they exchange Louis the you know, Louis Louis the who, who for President Macron, who rules from the Elysee you know, with a grandeur and an arrogance? You know, yes. moi je suis Napoleon. Yes, you know, I mean, yes. just just absurd. Do you think actually, though, that when you talk about uh, this connection, uh, well, they, they are, they, these ideas are connected as well, aren't they? The idea that there aren't these kind of abstract universal rights, right? yeah. but also that in fact uh, we are tied to something. In this case, England. Um, our history. Yeah, our history. Do you think that that sort of came as something new to the audience that you were talking to at this conference? I they think a lot of people, I think again, it was, you, you, there was an intake of breath when I attacked universal rights. Because of course, we are, it's so built into our notion, yes. particularly since 45. But remember, th that notion of, of universal human rights in 45 um, was a very deliberate attempt at finding how could we condemn the German Nazi leaders when what they'd done was legal in terms of their own country. In other words, it's the necessary foundation for Nuremberg. Mm. Why? Or you could argue that it's the necessary mm. foundation for Nuremberg. So you go, and what you try to do again is very, very clear. You know, you've had two monstrous world wars within 20 years. Of, mm. Mm. We forget just how close, mm. 25 mm. years of each other. Yeah, uh, yeah. This, the, the, uh, uh, less, isn't it? Um, uh, 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 and, and, uh, exactly. 20 years. I mean, th these, these horrors, you can see why there's a fashion for a, a notion of world government, you can see why uh, there's a whole argument which not only leads to the setting up of the United Nations or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, why 
it leads to the setting up of the EU with mm. the profound conviction of some of the leaders of France and Germany that their respective nationalisms have been, dis you know, been disastrous and have led. I mean, not simply, remember, between France and Germany, it's not simply two world wars of the 20th century. It's a major war every century yeah. going back yeah. to the, well, going back to my period. I mean, those ambassadors there are involved with England as the third party between France and, and, and the Habsburg, Charles V. And the wars between France, <coughs> France and the Habsburgs begin, I suppose you could argue, in the 1490s in Italy, and they just continue straight yeah. through as, as, as you know, appalling distance. It's very easy to see. Um, but, but it seems to me that, that, again, as Burke correctly understood, and indeed many other thinkers have understood, the notion of abstract rights is an absurdity. Mm. The great English, well, I'm not quite sure, well, Bentham, uh, Jeremy Bentham, you know, he who's he whose pickled head is preserved yes. at uni <laughs> between his knees at University College. Um, uh, ben Bentham calls universal rights. Forgive me. <coughs> he calls too much lunch. <coughs> he calls universal rights nonsense on stilts. Yes. I mean, where do they come from? Yeah, 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 is yeah. there such a thing as universal natural law? No, of course there isn't, yeah. unless you believe in God. And this is why, this is the connection between what I was talking about with Thomas More, who of course does believe. Yes. And again, Henry VIII, when it comes to the great conflict with the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church deploying a doctrine of universal law, which is allegedly embodied in the church militant, as exemplified in the Pope and the Pope's legal system. So there have been all these other quasi or actually universalist systems as opposed to the uh, as as opposed to the specificities of the nation state i mean what what i would argue is that the only unit that has ever generated things we all value which is political freedom the possibility of improvement a built-in prejudice towards progress is the nation yes, state. I would agree with that. The, the, yeah. Natural, yeah. the natural unit for multi-ethnic society is absolutism and the empire. Mm. And, and it, you see again it seems to me to be no accident that the dreadful limitations on freedom of speech uh, are, have coincided in our own society with multiculturalism. I was uh, talking about this very thing <coughs> last night. There, there, there is absolutely yeah, no yeah, accident. Yeah. And interestingly enough, uh, are you familiar with the work? I never know how to pronounce his name. Is it Muchangama? Um, yeah. um, a Dane, um, uh, but a remarkable man. And what he's done, he has looked at the debates around the, uh, the implementation. Remember, the Declaration of Universal Human Rights is 46, Eleanor Roosevelt or whatever. And then there are a series of United Nations panels that work out how to translate that mm. from a broad-based mm. declaration into a binding convention. Yep. And those panels were largely taken over by Soviet Russia and its satellites. And they used, interestingly enough, they use colonialism and the problem of, of blacks' race relations in America as devices to justify the repression of freedom. Mm -hmm. And they do it in the most interesting way. They argue that you can only protect the rights of minorities by diminishing the rights of the majority. Well, and yes. it's, you know, yeah. but that's exactly yeah. what's happened, yeah. and it's catastrophic. Yeah. Um, because of course, the only thing that that justifies, the only thing that creates Western society, is freedom. Yeah. Uh, is the freedom of thought, the freedom of expression, the freedom, the, and the creativity of mind and technology, and everything that goes with that. It, it, it's interesting, actually, if you if you take Britain over the past, let's say, twenty years. Um, these restrictions on free speech, hate speech laws, all of this, um, they seem to have um, increased at the time we have become super diverse. Precisely. As well. I mean, they, they are direct, the, the facts are directly related to mm. each other. I think it's a misconception. You see, I think it's also a misconception. Mm. 
um, in that, um, and I was having a very interesting encounter, just, 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 um, I, I had a very interesting encounter just as I left the, the conference that we were talking about, uh, who was a Muslim, uh, but a Muslim involved in conservative politics. And he was saying, you know, um, 800,000 Muslims voted for Brexit. Mm. I mean, the, again, we heard in the conference that remarkable man, Konstantin Kissin, mm. a, a Russian, a passionate defender of the West. Mm. Many of our most passionate defenders are immigrants yes, because yes. they actually came here willfully they buy mm, in mm. whereas in fact what we prioritize through the left are immigrants who say oh the uh, this society must adapt to us yeah, rather yeah, than yes. we must adapt to that to it i mean i am by no means heaven's sake both of us are dissenters textually in all sorts of other ways. And um, I've never been a believer in uniformity. What, what you need, you need a, you need a society um, in which forms of, of civility uh, and, uh, uh, and openness of discourse enable you to encounter difference, celebrate difference. Mm. I mean, how boring the world. I'd find the world terribly boring if I had nobody to disagree with. You know, <laughs> I would have to disagree with myself. I think that's I, most unlikely which, with you, David. Which, which, <laughs> which I, <laughs> no. do you I think, occasionally do. You know, you, you, the, 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 I don't want to go on too much about this conference, but I think, as I understand it with this national conservatism as it comes over from America, is uh, born of the belief that the mainstream conservative parties just simply are not up to it anymore. I mean, you know, that they mm -hmm. don't worry <clears throat> about this kind of thing. They don't even understand it particularly. I mean, when you look, I mean, there have been some conservative party uh, senior politicians speaking at this conference but on the whole um, I don't get any sense I didn't at this conference as well which I took part in myself uh, of urgency about any of these issues whereas I sort of see them as being urgent. I would agree completely. I think there are two things to national conservatism as I understand it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean one is it's an academic movement yeah. and it comes from Israel yeah. essentially. I mean it's, it's American, it's Israeli, Israeli American uh, Yoram Hazoni yeah. who I think begins in New Jersey uh, and finishes up in Israel um, is, is, its, is its principal inspiration and the nature of the Israeli state and of course it's very conscious invocation of a particular kind of nationhood yeah. uh, and a particular kind and very close again another element the very close uh, relationship which has only sees between nation and religion yeah. Yeah. which of course as a Jew you would um, uh, and again one of the things that, uh, that national conservatism is very strongly associated with in America is the fact that much of the right in America is overtly religious Yes, exactly. This is yes. not true here. Yeah. And what was striking, I mean, there were many voices raised at the conference, you know, particularly people of, of Roman Catholic background, uh, that were, uh, were, 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 were advocating this. But in England, it just seems to me that is not a basis for serious political activity. It really, really mm -hmm. isn't. Whereas in you know, some of my off the cuff comments, I was arguing instead that history um, actually offers you. I, I dared even to use the word transcendence. Mm. That that there's a great poem. Uh, I think again, English is a language which is very recent language. Only it really formulates itself in the late 14th century. But it is it is bizarrely the world's most poetic language, in which perhaps the greatest thoughts of poetry, obviously Shakespeare. But in modern times, uh, and Shakespeare, by the way, is profoundly interested. Mm in these kind of questions uh, of, of place and history and, and whatever. Um, but for me, the most moving are T.S. Eliot, the, the poems, the so-called Four Quartets, and particularly uh, Little Gidding, which is his experience in a tiny rural mm -hmm. parish church um, as the sunlight falls on a winter's evening. And he has this sense of the footfall of mm. centuries, mm. of those who've been there. He has a sense of a broad historical canvas of those who fought on one side, those who fought on another, and all sharing mm. common fate, you mm. know, that we are, in other words, under our feet, there is both the cavalier and the roundhead. Mm. There is the Norman and the Saxon yes. and whatever. And that we are, we are this product mm. of them all. And the section has this 
culminating refrain, history is now and England. Mm. And I am more and more struck by that. I get that feeling. I know from conversations in the street with taxi drivers, all sorts of people, lots of people get it. Yeah, yeah. There was a particularly moving moment uh, in one of the sessions of the conference, you know, a rather random one, at lunchtime, in which somebody shockingly disabled, I clearly had barely got hands, explained how history had given him the release from the purgatory of his body. Yes. I found it. Henry George, I think I found it yeah. profoundly. Yeah, yeah. Prof yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true and it's exactly it's exactly what Burke is talking mm. about mm. I mean Burke again remember uh, we talk of him as philosopher he's not he's a great rhetorician um, and indeed the Prince Regent I mean we forget this the future George IV began by thinking the French Revolution was a very good thing they mm. all thought the French were doing 1689 yeah. um, and so when, when the reflection on the revolution comes out what does George, what does the Prince Regent say to Burke such Tough, Mr. Burke, such stuff. <laughs> you know, in other words, over the top rhetoric. Um, but, but, but what, but what Burke grasped, he grasped the emotion, yeah. and he grasped that politics is not simply about reason. Yeah. He dares to talk about love. You know, we use the word love of country and patriotism in a very light way. Um, it can be and should be a very powerful thing. But this is the, the this is the point really. When we talk about culture wars now and fighting back and this sort of thing it's reason is not enough is it no reason is not enough you but it's also love. but it's also that what really drives the left isn't reason it's hatred mm. they have substituted love of country for hatred of mm. country mm. i mean there's a there's a kind of loathsome self hatred Mm. I mean, you you get they suffer from hatred of the fact they're educated, hatred of, hatred of the fact they're prosperous, hatred of the fact they went to Oxbridge, mm -hmm. hatred of the fact they went to public school. Which there's a quality that's rancid. Yes. There is the yes. smell of rancid. There, there there's a sense of people gone stale. Um, uh, I think we're far too polite to them. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in favour of a much more robust response. We're fools and try to fight them on their own ground. Oh, qu quite. Well, I think that's the problem for the, of the, the modern Tory party, yeah. actually. Well, 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 in fact, it's absorbed most of yes, this nonsense. Exactly. I yeah, mean, the yeah, catastrophe yeah. Is, uh, is are the, are, are, are the, uh, the Osborne Cameron mm. Gove years mm. in which they consciously model themselves on new labour. You know, mm. Gove went around distributing copies of Blair's memoirs saying mm. this was the new Machiavelli, for mm. God's sake. Is it any wonder that things go as catastrophically wrong? Can I, that, that point you just made there, if I just want, just want to, uh, to go back to that about transcendental history, I mean finding transcendentalism in history. Uh, you're, you're not you're not a man of faith are you no uh, not whatever. Not, not, yes. no i mean i i mean l let me just explain yeah. quickly why i was brought up a quaker mm. um and i found it profoundly dissatisfying mm. uh what quakerism is it's christianity script uh, stripped of all creedal formulae uh, and instead it believes in a doctrine of universal human goodness, mm. that of God in every man, and uh, there is there is there is no there is no liturgy or whatever. You simply gather together, allegedly in silence, mm. to wait for the spirit to strike. Mm. And even as a teenage boy, I remember sitting in a very beautiful meeting house in Kent, a very fine Georgian building. My father, as clerk, spent endless time making sure it was immaculately maintained and whatever, sitting watching the pattern of the sunlight of the Georgian windows moving across the floor, bored out of my head. Um, and one of my masters, uh, schoolmasters, Edmund Mounsey, was also a Quaker and he was a strong influence on me. And you can tell what a hideously you know, um, precocious youth I was. Um, uh, he'd, noticed that, that he'd noticed that I was manifestly very bored in meeting. I was not, I've never been very good at concealing the fact that I am very bored. Anyway, uh, he, and of course, still being in school rather than outside it, outside it, he would have addressed me as David as we were in school. Of course, in those days, you were called Starkey, Starkey. I noticed, you know, that you were very rather bored. Yes, sir. Again, I would have called him Edmund outside school, but in school, of course, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Um, 
uh, and also I'm, I'm very puzzled. Can you explain to me, sir? Um, I thought um, you were only supposed to speak in meeting if you were moved by the Holy Spirit. Mm. Yes, that is correct. How is it, sir, that the Holy Spirit always seems to have read the day before's Manchester Guardian? <laughs> <laughs> but he got me. He said, oh, Starkey, you don't understand. The Holy Spirit wrote the Manchester <laughs> But uh, just, just one second, and then I'll come back to you. Um, I then reacted from that, because, again, what you're supposed to do as a Quaker is you conduct your own services. Mm. So, for example, you marry yourself. Well, that's fine. My parents did that. And I still have the fascinating register entry, which is everybody present in the meeting. I can trace everybody that they knew. I'm writing my autobiography. I've got this because they're all, they all signed their name as, as witnesses. Yeah. But you're also supposed to conduct your own funeral. I mean, not the dead body, of course, <laughs> but the survivors. I found that completely impossible. From what? what uh, well, be, for, because I could not, I could I have spoken over my... Yeah, were my father yeah. my mother's body no my father did it with my mother and fortunately my aunt did it with my father who survived her i think there's a need for mediation i think there's a need for ceremony mm -hmm. so i'm a ceremonious atheist i'm a high church atheist sorry about no no you. does that does that make you a what is now called a cultural christian yes very strongly i mean except that i don't accept christian moral values i do not accept I, I think in many ways Christianity is pernicious as a set of moral values. The cultivation of victimhood, mm. you know, the, mm. the, 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 that we worship a self-tortured a, a tortured God and whatever. I find all that very mm. uncomfortable. Mm. The, 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 the elevation of, you know, the poor and all the rest of it. I really have very little sympathy for mm. that. Which is not to say I'm a, a strong worshiper. No, I'm not no. a worshiper, a strong man at all. But um, as somebody who was born, not with serious, but with substantial disability, um, uh, uh, my reaction, it was one that I was vigorously trained your by. Foot, your foot. Yeah, I was, I was born with club feet and whatever, yeah. polio. Um, was, you know, you're not a victim, you fight it. Mm, um, mm, I, the, you know, I've got a certain, I broad shoulders, literally mm, and yeah. as, as, as well as metaphorically. But, but do you think, therefore, that um, love of country or love of the country's history, um, that is that is a good substitute for the love that you might have got from being a Christian? I mean, you know, I think it, I think that these think people, in that, in that context, as you said, religion comes quite, quite, uh, it becomes quite central. I totally get it when you say that this in this country it will prove very difficult yeah i but think i think that the, the the best way we can do it is that i don't believe that we offer again obviously history doesn't offer a salvation mm. narrative but it offer as christianity in some of its certainly in all of its forms finally offers a salvation narrative um, an explanation for human existence but what what our history offers is a story of remarkable national achievement, of continuity of institutions, mm. of the creation of both institutions and buildings and cities, and above all, landscape mm. of staggering beauty, mm -hmm. of world-recognized value. It's as the civilization, and again, we, we need to be saying these things, mm. modernity is an English invention. Modernity mm. is invented yes. in Eng yeah. Moder fundamentally. Modernity is invented in England uh, in the last two and a half decades of the 17th century. That's when it happens. That astonishing period of Locke and Newton. I mean, the, you know, Voltaire recognizes this fact. Um, and, you know, God said, "God said, let Newton be, and all was light." Yeah. Sort of thing. I mean, the, 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 it really is true. Um, and uh, what is also very striking is that if you look at our 19th and early 20th century experience, uh, those who agitated for change, uh, be it the, all the people that you know now fashionably taught in schools, um, the the uh, the Chartists, the, the 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 trade unionists, the suffragettes, and whatever, none of them did what their later successors want to do. None of them fought to tear institutions no, down. No, 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 they no thought to become part of them. Yes. They didn't want to, uh, you know, they were not like the sans-culottes in Paris. 
hundred years earlier, they didn't want to tear down Versailles. They didn't want to tear. They didn't want to tear down uh, the structures of monarchy. They uh, Parliament. They wanted to become part of them. They mm. wanted the franchise, mm. and that seems to me to be an extraordinary. I mean, that is genuinely inspiring story. Mm. Mm. That and and again, there's a, there's a kind of terrible sense of failure on the part of a lot on the left. Oh, we didn't have a revolution. Wouldn't have, isn't a revolution important? Isn't there something terribly defective about not having a revolution? For sake look at yes. the consequences yes. of Russia of China of yeah. of of everywhere of everywhere that's had a revolution look at the infinite horror the total the absolute destructiveness I mean again I think we I mean, even Sharma for whom I do not have all that much regard in many ways he dares to say in his book on the French Revolution which has never been published in France as I understand it he dares to emphasize the sheer destruction vile horror of the terror mm. and here I mean, here the French elevate it the, 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 the Marseillaise has got a, a good tune do you know the words may the may the blood of the impure soak our furrows yes. I mean, what sort of song is that to sing impure yeah, yes the yeah. blood of the impure yeah, yes soak our furrows you know, the elevation of a place you know you see it's much of a death cult as the worst worst kind of Islam Yes, um, which is why, again, I think you can't just talk about nationalism as a source of value. Mm. I mean, many nationalisms have been utterly catastrophic. Of mm. course, they have. Mm. Uh, right, if, if you've got a blood and iron nationalism, as, as becomes the case in Germany or whatever, it's deeply destructive. Mm. But again, that requires discrimination. Mm. It requires a recognition of the extraordinarily different quality of English history, mm. particularly English. Mm. Scotland coming in very, very importantly in the 18th century, but having a wildly different story before that. Um, and I, I, I think, again, we've lost that sense. And we, the, you know, everybody goes on about the Sonderweg, the unique way of German history. It isn't. The unique history is that of the, Ang is the Anglophone history. Yes, yes. Again, it also transfers itself to empire. The, the, uh, the, the, the British Empire is the only empire that willed its own end. Mm. That you you build in from the Durham report through to the Statute of Westminster, uh, whatever the notion of self-government as being the natural outcome, mm. and you you actively further this process. And the last phase of empire, liberal empire, is you know, self-consciously sort of saying we've got to train them up and make sure they can do it. Yes, um, and yeah. of course, in many societies, in frankly, in societies that are primarily Western derived, in other words colonially planted societies mm. it works in tribal ones it doesn't because again that and we see this terrible lesson uh, in Afghanistan and most of the Middle East tribal societies cannot accommodate our notion of freedom mm. they can even the catastrophe of Iraq the catastrophe mm. of Libya the catastrophe particularly Afghanistan you know the absurdity that you in, in, invade a country to defend the right of women to wear miniskirts I mean you know mm. just mm. The, mm. the sheer demented notion Mm. Um, uh, of of uh, of uh, uh, again deriving from a notion of universal values. Yes. You know, yes. if you actually believe yes. in universal values, of course you know that um, when Americans invade Iraq, the Iraqis go, "Oh, wonderful!" You know, uh, they're going to bring us universal values. Isn't that nice? Uh, you know, the Iraqi warlord, sorry, the, the Afghan war warlord will go, "Isn't it marvelous?" You know, our girls are going to be able to dress up just like whores in New York. You know, isn't this exactly what we want? Do you think that, uh, and actually, you uh, were commentating at great length, in fact, you covered the whole coronation for GB News and everything recently, didn't you? Um, do you think that the coronation, which is a very significant moment in this English, history, English story, British story, do you think that it reflected any of the feelings that you have been talking yes, about? Yes, I mean, it reflected some of them. I mean, I... I remember before, sorry, David, I saw you talking at the Hungarian Embassy. Yeah. And uh, you were kind of f full of a, well, a bit of foreboding about the way it was being mucked about with. Mm. Mm. I'll go into that. Let me tell you where I thought it worked, because that was the question mm. you asked. I thought that the actual rituals are so extraordinary 
Mm. I mean, the, for me, the, 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 the climactic moment, well, indeed it is the climax, is when the king, crowned, robed, bearing orb and scepter uh, uh, and the vast train, walks down the length of mm. Westminster Abbey, supported by two bishops. Mm. Everybody said it's like Game of Thrones. It's not. Game of Thrones is like that yeah. touches something <laughs> yeah. really yeah. deep in the psyche, which mm. of course is why things like Game of Thrones work. Game of Thrones is just a parody of English medieval history. Mm. That's mm. all it is. Mm. No, that, that's really Horse all it, roses, yeah. that, that, That's yeah. all it is. And it, it, it has its popular purchase because both of narrative in terms of extraordinary mm. uninhibited human behavior on the one hand, the game of power on the other, and then the rituals and the symbolism. So that, that remained, and, and, and many of the things that I'd worried about, like the uh, cutting back of the grand opera aspect of the thing. I mean, if you go back, I'm old, I'm old enough to remember the coronation of 53, I was eight. I saw it for the first time on, I, was the first time I'd seen television, our neighbors. Needless to say, and my mother, I still remember, she loathed Mrs. Sargentson, who was our next door neighbour, and correctly uh, divined how the television set had been obtained. Where she was, we were all very dressed up, and she was wearing one of those Chanel style, Dior style costumes, very tight. Oh, yes. yes. Of course, terribly, terribly erect, you know, like this. She got a fox fur on it. <laughs> I expect it was a product of immoral earnings. <laughs> She's she absolutely right, of course. But anyway, as I, I didn't know at the time what it meant, of course. But I, the, the extraordinary performance was etched in my mind. But anyway, uh, but that coronation, of course, was grand opera because it had the grand opera chorus. It had the peers all dressed in the same way, all performing certain acts like the putting on of the coronet as the king put on his crown, um, and the peeresses all described like, you know, extras in Swan Lake, they all wear sleeveless white dresses, mm. and, and their mm. arms come up and their coronets go on and whatever. That had less of an, th th that omission had less of an impact than I thought because of television. Because television yes. focused on yes. the narrow area of what's, again, it's called the Coronation Theatre. Yes. It's, yes. it's a piece of theatre, it's a technical name. And of course, the choir boys were all in red and scarlet mm. in just the same way that mm. the peers had been. So you had something that was visually highly coherent. The, for me, the great omissions was the omission of politics. Right. If you'd, if you'd watch that coronation knowing nothing of English history and knowing nothing of England's current position, you'd have thought Charles was an absolute divine right monarch. Yes. You would, I mean, you yes. really would. And again, the yes. language that will be used, yeah. preposterous. Yeah. Whereas in fact, the this, this came about because, uh, because of a highly inexperienced prime minister, a very talented prime minister, but somebody who is you know, outside our, of course he is, how can he not be? Um, and only he's only been in parliament since 2015. Somebody really isn't rooted, and indeed a party that has hardly anybody who has any serious historical knowledge. M most of them, they've all done PPE, which, yeah, just, yeah. which just views politics as, 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 as a series of techniques, you know. Yeah. The, the culminating product of Oxford's PPE is Matt Hancock, yeah. you know, is, is the tri Hancock is the triumph and disaster of PPE. Anyway, um, so there'd been no serious input from the palace, and it's a, what again nobody understood, because so few can remember. It's the first, this is the first coronation since 1689, the Glorious Revolution, when the entirety of Parliament has not been present. And about 20, wasn't there? 20 a, a, a handful of handful. both houses. This is a monstrous. Mm. It is a, again, this is why the King had to keep scuttling off to Westminster Hall to address them to placate them. And this was because of, of partly you were able to do it because of the collapse in the mm. reputation of Parliament and the general public standing of MPs. But it's also because Parliament has decided, the, the government has decided, well, the palace does its own thing. Um, and instead, the king was able to come up with this bizarre congregation mm. that, you know, mm. 500, you know, good folk from, yes, from yeah. winners of the British Empire Medal um, and a sort, you know, <coughs> a licorice all sort of charities. And, uh, and again, the president of foreign rulers. So the coronation is changed from what it should, what, what the coronation is, it's a double 
series of contracts, mm. as well as a, it's a consecration, which we obviously saw. Uh, but it should be a double cons it should be double contract and double consecration. It's a consecration, if you believe in God, of the monarch by and to God, but also the monarch, in, which again the, was spelled out, as indeed was the consecration of the monarch to a notion of service, mm. which was heavily written in, including turning the queen, the late queen, into a kind of new saint of the royal dynasty. Yes. And because you actually quoted her words into yes, the text yes. of the coronation service. Um, but above all, it's a contract. It's a contract between the king and God, yes, hence the oath, but it's a contract between the king and his people. Mm. And those oaths are the 1689 oaths. And again, it, the first, first one of them is distorted to take account of the fact that he's king of more than one realm. So you mm. can't just say laws made by parliament because it's also Australia, Canada, New Zealand, whatever. Um, uh, but it should be, what it should say is, I swear to rule by the laws passed in parliament. Mm. Now the crown is part of parliament. The, cr the, crown is, the crown is the executive force of Parliament. Uh, remember, the enacting clause of a statute is, be it therefore enacted by mm. the King's most excellent majesty, mm. with the advice and consent of the Lord Spiritual and Temporal and Commons in this present Parliament assembled by that. And um, it's also, again, it's, it's a compact on justice, to do justice in mercy and in truth. And then finally, a compact to maintain the Protestant religion, as established in law uh, by 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 par well, parliamentary convention of 1689 and the Act of Settlement, that rather leapt out at me actually. That yes, when, it, uh, you know, I thought, good Lord, that's quite explicit actually. It's totally explicit. Yeah. I mean, again, because what we need to when I talked about this extraordinary invention of modernity in England. It's a product of that settlement of yeah. 1689. Before 1689, late 17th century England is effectively a French colony. Oh, it's, it's a French protectorate. Yeah. With that settling of the religious question, England already by 1705 defeats France at Blenheim. Do you know where Blenheim is? Where the battle is? Oh, where the actual battle? Yeah. Oh dear, I'm ashamed actually. No. Just outside Munich. How, Munich yeah. how do you fight a land battle just outside Munich <laughs> if you are British? Can you imagine the astonishing achievement in terms of logistics, <laughs> diplomacy yeah. and finance that's involved in that? Yes. More this is why Churchill learns to fight the Second World War by writing a three volume biography of Marlborough, his great yes, ancestor. Yes. That's exactly what he does. But it is this, what, what 1689 does is to produce this astonishingly liberal monarchy. The building we should all go to, you shouldn't have, it'd be lovely if, we could, if I could press a button now and we could have a new backdrop. But what we need, <laughs> and, and again, it was, it was what I used when we were doing that. You talked about my coverage on GB News. Yes. I also made, dare I say, I think two very good documentaries oh, yes, no, it, on it. Crown, right. yes. One of the things that we use is the Painted Hall at Greenwich, yes. which is the celebration of the Glorious Revolution and the Hanoverian Accession. And you look at the ceiling of the Painted Hall, what it celebrates <coughs> is the triumph of modernity and empire. Mm. It celebrates the triumph of science, of navigation, of invention, and above all, the triumph of Britannia and the British mm. Navy. And mm. this again, you see, we we talk about empire as though it was some sort of you know wicked dark capitalist conspiracy it's not what happens in britain is you invent a new world yes. and that new world was destined to conquer the old world mm. and even countries that aren't directly conquered like japan and china they've got to catch up with it and yeah. you know what their processes of internal adaptation were often just as bit. Every, look at China; every bit as nasty or nastier than colonial oh conquest. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, were you? So we've been talking about emotion a bit. Were you moved by the coronation? Not bearing in mind how I was covering it. Remember, I was, I was, I was in wild discomfort. The weather was filthy. Oh, One was right, perched yes. on a hard stool uh, yeah. under an inadequate. Those, those let me finish. Terrible stools they give you, uh, right? uh, un under an inadequate tent, yes. um, uh, squinting at a tiny monitor yeah. and listening to that magnificent music on a yeah. tinny earpiece. Yeah. So no, I wasn't. I mean, it was, it was the way I was dealing with it was the, I haven't and I haven't yet gone back and looked at. You know, 
high uh, HD and version mm. with with full sound, which I must because mm. clearly it it was magnificently staged. I mean, it's very alienating. I mean, you as a commentator to try to imagine. Yes, what it really is like, yeah. but what you're dealing with is this. I think, as you put it earlier, it was incredibly intimate. I mean, you know, it, because that's what modern TV's got to be now. But they, when they also, it was intimate because of the king's decision. So few people are involved. Mm. I mean, if you go back to the coronation mm. of the queen, there was there was this enormous hierarchy of you know mm. the great and good of the land mm. all paying homage. Mm. With Charles, there was just that one moment of the Prince of Wales, mm. that intense sense of intimacy, mm. and then the catastrophic misjudgment of the homage of the people. Yes. Catastrophic Terrible. I just didn't. It, you went right, it, 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 I, I thought immediately when that came up. Oh, I, no, thought, no. I thought of Blair. Yes. I thought that's a Blair thing. That's it's just somehow to completely misjudge. Yeah. And, uh, and also, again, to assume that you can simply translate something that had been an elite activity. You know, yeah. again, noble houses that in many ways regard the Windsors as really rather jumped up. Yeah, but yeah. You know, the rules dictate you do yeah. this. I mean, I, I, I always enjoy, I was a great friend. Uh, academic friend of Bertrand Russell's youngest son, Conrad Russell, of course, immensely distinguished family. And Conrad always told the story of his grandmother, who would refer to oh, that royal canaille. You know, <laughs> think this is the court. This is the court of, the, of Edward the Seventh. You know, she thought yeah. absolute sort of social. You know, jumped up, <laughs> disgusting, deplorable behaviour. They smoked in public. They you know, went 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 to, went to nasty horse races. They yeah. mingled with low people like. Yeah. Banker, bankers and <laughs> brewers and, and you know, landlords and whatever, you know, the, du the duchess sort of reared up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought, I, thought it, I, I was actually moved, because obviously I was just watching it on television, yeah. and I was watching it in a room with people in a hotel down in Sussex. Not kidding, you could have heard a pin drop, and they were all ages actually. However, since then, I've sort of thought it was all rather sad. Charles's general counsel, his demeanour, very sad, and and also those pictures, those official pictures. Uh, you know, obviously, we grew up seeing Cecil Beaton's glorious, you know, Abbey Abbey backdrops and everything. Um, but they seem very. Um, he's rather slumped in in in. in I think in he's jolly uh, tired. Yes, he's they're tired. Take, they're, they're taken immediately. They're taken immediately afterwards. Yes, yes. He's had a fit of temper also because the carriage arrived early yeah. and the Prince and Princess of Wales were therefore out of sequence. Yeah. You know that you know yeah. the actual entry into the yeah. Abbey was very badly, very badly uh, well, mixed they, up. Well, they managed to get him by lip reading, didn't they? And he uh, they, well, I mean, we knew, I mean, I think oh, we were the only channel actually to say so oh, because right. I, I would, I'd already talked about the order of precedence. Yeah, yeah. In other words, that they were doing a reverse order of precedence. So yeah. the king, king and queen come last. Um, but of course, you then realised well the, there wasn't because you were missing the next most important people, the Prince and Princess yeah, of Wales, yeah. and we also timed it. They arrived six minutes early. Whoever was the adjutant in charge, I imagine, has been <laughs> cashiered <laughs> and you were dismissed without a pension and whatever. But so the king had had a fit of paddy and and had to be calmed down, and he was tired. But the other thing is that the. Uh, the consequence of the driving into outer darkness of Andrew and the self-immolation of Harry is that the, most of the working royal family now are the Queen's cousins. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. They're not very much younger than she was. Yes, right? so the, it so looks so very decrepit. It, it, and again, again, there is this element, I'm afraid, of decrepitude, which also, um, um, have, you been, uh, have you been recently to a Garth, you live in Windsor, yeah. have you been le recently to a garter service. No, I mm. haven't, but uh, no, it, they happen inside the walls. They, so they, 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 they happen yeah, inside yeah, in St George's Chapel. Well, I was. Are they all getting pretty ancient? Well, yeah. uh, well uh, they were, but they're dying off. But the thing that really strikes you, uh, well, it's quite a few of them were pretty ancient. Uh, and of course, the last time I saw it, the Queen was, was, was of course, still alive. Um, uh, but the thing that was most striking were the, was a bodyguard of the gentleman pensioners, which I must say uh, made the photograph of the uh, aging members of the royal family look positively lithesome. You've never <laughs> seen, you've never seen such an arthritic much. <laughs> no, I thought it was a, a very uh, old court. Yes. You said before we started filming actually that you're talking about the descendants of George V very much in, mm. in, yeah, this, yeah. in this yeah. area. And I, I thought it was rather mis misjudged actually to have 
you know, Princess Alexandra, uh, very graceful lady, but 86. I mean, she's being virtually... 89, I think. 89. I think she's, I think mm. she's 89. And these other sort of strangely w w were once peripheral people, like the, the, the Duke of Gloucester, uh, uh, Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. But, I mean, overall, do you think... Are you surprised it even happened? David? I mean, you know, I remember in the 1970s, my mother and the next door neighbour used to talk over the garden wall, and I used to butt in and everything. And I, it was almost a scene. Well, of course, by the end of the century, we wouldn't even have one properly. This was in the 1970s. But I was thinking, this is happening in 2023. Okay, truncated, but in essence the same. Um, does that astonish you or not? No, I mean, I think that, that by and large, uh, we have valued cer ceremony. I mean, I talked about my experience of Quakerism mm. and, the uh, and, and the valuing of ceremony. We learned what it was like to try to do without in the Civil mm. War of the 17th century. I mean, remember all the regalia that you saw being used was reinvented mm. in 1661. I mean, we had, a, we had a revolution that in terms of the elimination of the apparatus of monarchy was much more thorough than that of the French mm. in 1789. Uh, because, of course, and, and by the time you've got to the end of the 18th century, you've got a sense of his historicity. You've got a sense of things being important historically. So whereas you destroy the 18th century crowns and all the rest of it, you keep you know, the great Carolingian symbols, uh, the man de justice mm -hmm. and all the rest, they're kept, they're put in a museum. Um, the, similarly, when the French revolutionaries confiscate the royal possessions, they don't flog them. I mean, the Puritans flog the lot. The, Charles I had the greatest collection of old masters in Europe. You mm. just put them on the open market, and they are now the glories of the Prado and 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 of, of, of the Alta Pinacoteca. But they brought them all together. Do you remember at the Royal Academy a few years ago? Yeah, they, but yeah, indeed. Yeah. But I mean, utterly magnificent. Yeah. All the spread, <laughs> whereas the French revolutionaries create the Louvre mm. as a great museum. Mm. So I mean, we had a, in that sense a much more absolute revolution. Mm. But equally, we reverse it. Mm. We decide anyway, because what we did, we stepped from the a very modest frying pan uh, of, of Charles the First absolutism into the full-blown militaristic horror uh, of of the rule of, of Major Generals and and Thomas Cromwell uh, and sorry not Thomas Oliver I might, th that's that Cromwell um, <laughs> uh, 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 of, of 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 Oliver Cromwell who was of course fully it was correctly represented as Caesar in his coinage is is. 1656 coinage he's actually shown as an image of Caesar you know profile head laurel wreath um, and and the inscription you know Latin inscription yes. uh, by the grace of God yes. protector of the of, 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 of England Scotland Ireland uh, 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 um, let me let me get the blah, 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 uh, protector of the republics of that's right, right the republic the Commonwealth of England, right. Scotland, Ireland, right. protector. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, uh, it's still with us anyway, in some shape. Or yes, way. it is still with us. I mean, I, I get the sense that William will be much less interested in that. I mean, I think again, oddly enough, I mean, even although I was being very dismissive about the Commonwealth and Cromwell, Cromwell's second inauguration as protector may offer a model as to what will happen when William succeeds. Oh. I cannot imagine, well, I may be completely wrong, I don't get any sense that he has the quasi-mystical religious belief of his father. I think it quite possible that we would take the model of the, the second protectoral inauguration in which they use the coronation chair, but they put it in Westminster Hall, oh, and they right. invested him with a yeah. robe, a Bible, an orb, and a sword. Very he's, in other words, yeah. he's, he's invested, not a crown, yes. but of course they could give him a crown this time round. Though of course Cromwell is buried with the crown. crown Cromwell is given full royal honours when he dies. Um, the only choice, in, the only choice by the end of the 1650s was whether you had King Oliver or King Richard, his son Richard, or whether you had King Charles. It was only, you had a choice between it the It would Stuarts. have been Richard, wouldn't it, because uh, yeah. he was 
for two years after. He was, yes, he was protector. Yeah, it was, yeah. The protectorate was hereditary. The second protectorate yeah, was hereditary. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it was very much like Napoleon. Yes. I mean, th this is how the, this is how the notion of a universal model of, of revolutions arises. Mm -hmm. The really very striking comparisons in in a, I think in a superficial way between the English and the French revolutions produce all that boring sub-Marxist stuff and you know, Christopher Hill stuff um, uh, of the 1960s, oh, 1960s, yes, I, 60s, that I was, I was brought up on as an undergraduate. Oh, yes, same here. Uh, well, we still in the 1970s and 80s, we were at Kent. Um, the world turned upside down. And all that Hill, stuff. All yeah. of that stuff. David, thank you very, very much you know, for that. Um, would you say, because we have members, and we, what we do, we just have one, uh, we ask you like one or two questions just for them, uh, for the exclusive uh, content they have. But um, thank you very, very much, Doris. Thank you, and see you again soon. Thank you. Um, David Starkey, um, we shall see you next week on the show. Bye bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme? at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.